Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a federal agency weighs in against the Plaza de Panama project. And what happens now that President Obama has declared his support for same-sex marriage? Will it sway judges or lawmakers? We'll talk to people on both sides of the issue. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. The National Park Service is rejecting a proposal to remove cars from the heart of Balboa Park. The plan calls for building an access road off the Cabrillo Bridge and a parking garage behind the Oregon Pavilion. In a letter to City Councilman Kevin Falconer, the Park Service says the project will have a permanent, major, and adverse effect on the Balboa Park National Monument and will physically destroy a part of the property. You can see and comment on the letter at kpbs.org. Two San Diego school trustees are at odds about solutions for the district's financial troubles. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert is in the news center with a story. Kyla, who are the trustees and what are they saying? Well, board member Scott Barnett said today that he believes the district's insolvency is inevitable. Right now they have a plan to balance next year's budget by laying off more than 2,500 employees. And he said that doesn't do anything to sort of stave off a looming $100 million shortfall for the following year. So what he wants board members to do is to rescind all of those layoff notices and leave next year's budget unbalanced. And that would trigger a state takeover. He says it would also mean another year of more fully staffed schools for students. And the uh, board president, John Lee Evans, held a press conference this morning to counter that proposal, saying that the board is still committed to balancing the budget, still committed to solving the financial, financial problems, and maintaining control of the school district. Now, we've got a no number of other trustees on the board. What are the chances that some of them may back Barnett's proposal? It seems unlikely. When the state takes over a school district, they appoint a trustee, they fire the superintendent, and take away the board's governing uh, ability to govern and that trustee has unilateral decision-making power to do things like lay off employees and close schools and that's something that board members said uh, just a few months ago that they were committed to avoiding it's a very drastic measure education reporter Kyla Calvert the ACLU is calling for an investigation into claims of abuse by Customs and Border Protection agents along the border with Mexico. ACLU attorneys say legal border crossers are being harassed, interrogated and strip searched. CBP says it doesn't tolerate abuse within its ranks. Campaign mailers often include lists of facts to support their positions. Oceanside voters are being flooded with flyers for and against Proposition E. It would phase out rent control in the city's 17 mobile home parks. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says there is reason to question whether these facts are true. She joins us by phone. What's the problem with the facts in this case, Allison? Well, Duane, the latest flyers come out saying that there's a fact that the city has uh, actually lost $7.5 million due to rent control in the last decade and that it will spend and lose $8 million over the next decade. This is from a report that was commissioned by the North County Association of Realtors and uh, done by Scott Barnett of TaxpayerAdvocate.org. Um, and the trouble is it's based on certain assumptions. And what are these assumptions or facts based on? Well, there's a couple of uh, troublesome assumptions, but perhaps one of the main ones is that he suggests that property taxes would be much higher without rent control. He says property values have been decreased by rent control. And um, the only trouble is with this, that uh, the county assessor points out you cannot increase property taxes because of Prop 13 unless the property is sold. And this is one of the things that the park owners have insisted that they are not planning on doing. The other thing is that uh, rents could perhaps increase three or four times uh, if rent controls abolished. But Scott Barnett's report suggests the value of the land would increase tenfold, which seems unlikely unless the whole, value, the whole uh, use of the land was changed to something quite different. And Allison, what about the people on the other side opposing Prop E? Are they touting questionable facts too? Well, they do say that affordable housing is being provided by rent control with no extra cost to the taxpayer. And there may actually be some costs. Uh, possibly those might be caused by the legal fees of the park owners suing the city to try to overturn rent control. 
uh, the fact is that it ignores some of the more complex aspects of the cost-benefit analysis, such as the fact that people on low rents have more to spend in Oceanside, and that would add to their sales tax revenue. All right. Reporter Allison St. John. President Obama's support for same-sex marriage was a defining moment for the gay rights movement. Joanne speaks to San Diegans on both sides of the debate at the roundtable. It was a direct statement that made clear the president's position on an issue that divides many Americans. Uh, at a certain point, I've just concluded that um, for me personally, it is important for me to go ahead and affirm that uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Joining me are Matt Stevens, partner with Progressive Law Group and instructor of constitutional law at UCSD. He's been working on LGBT civil rights for a decade. And Jennifer Roback Morris is an, is an economist, founder of the Ruth Institute, and a spokesperson for the National Organization for Marriage. Thank you both for being here. Jennifer, let's begin with you. Your organization believes marriage should be between a man and a woman. Now that the president has affirmed this position, how will this affect your efforts moving forward to preserve that view of marriage? Well, honestly, to tell you the truth, he has energized our base. I mean, I was doing some conservative radio yesterday um, all across the country, and the people who are calling me in are people were, who were basically kind of lukewarm about Mitt Romney because he's, you know, kind of, they think they perceive him as kind of gushy on these issues. But with Barack Obama making such a strong statement on the other side, many of the people on the social conservative base are going to be very motivated and very passionate about defeating Barack Obama in November. So I think, I feel like he's thrown us a, an interception. And uh, Team Romney has to not fumble the ball, and, and Team Nam has to not fumble the ball. But I, I think he's actually helped us. Now, Matt, let's go to you. We know know that Prop 8 has been tied up in the courts for a while now. That is a ban on same-sex marriage here in California. Do you think this could have an impact now? That's an interesting question, and I, and I do think that some of what the courts have done actually helped President Obama evolve in his thinking because he understands the legal ramifications and implications. So I think there's a, a, it's a two-way street, if you will. There are many Republican appointees on the bench who understand that Prop 8 is, in fact, unconstitutional. So I think that the uh, president coming out and voicing that position will lend support to any judge who might be on the fence for personal reasons about that. Do you think, that Jennifer, that this could ultimately lead to federal law that says same-sex marriage is legal everywhere? Well, I'm, that's the, that's the high-stakes game that we've been playing here all along, certainly with uh, the Defense of Marriage Act and also with the, the federal court case surrounding Proposition 8. The whole idea is to say there's a federal right to, uh, to genderless marriage, and we're going to find it at the federal level. And so all of those court cases, all of those different things going on at the state level, that doesn't matter anymore. And so I think that it's clear that as president, as the chief executive officer of the United States of America, Barack Obama has the power to do a lot of things to uh, move things in that direction. And in fact, let's be honest, he already has. I mean, he refused to defend the Defense of Marriage Act, which was in fact his responsibility as the chief executive officer of the United States. It's it's their responsibility to enforce the laws, and that was the law. And so he's already done things to push things along in the direction of, a, of a federal recognizing some kind of federal right to genderless marriage. I, I want to talk about the law a, a little bit, because what I found interesting last night in a lot of the commentary on this is some of the discussion was about how marriage and the law has changed already. When we look at women, uh, originally in the U.S., marriage was defined by British rule, and, and women were considered property. I, I, I came across this, too, late this morning. I want to show people at home. Now, this is a report from a section from a report from a committee in New York uh, referring to marriage. And it says, as society progresses, new wants are felt. New facts and combinations are presented, which constantly call for more or less of addition to the body of our laws. They believe that the time has come when certain alterations and amendments are, by common consent, admitted as proper and necessary. Now, this is comes from the New York Legislative Committee back in 1854. And this is a committee that said, you 
know what? We ought to make women, we ought to give women some rights. They shouldn't be property anymore. And it's acknowledging that society has changed, so let's change our laws regarding marriage. Aren't we at that same point today? Well, it depends on what you think the public purpose of marriage is. What is the essential public purpose of marriage? I think that the essential public purpose of marriage, as opposed to all the private purposes and private reasons people might have for getting married, the public purpose of marriage is to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. And if you didn't need to get that purpose done, if you didn't need to get that job done, I don't think anybody would have ever thought of lifelong sexual exclusivity or recognizing certain relationships as being special and different from others. I think it's essential in exactly that, pers in exactly that sense. If, if not for that purpose, you wouldn't have marriage well, at all. I, I want to so, go to you, Matt, because okay. we're running out of time. But first of all, I do want to show an excerpt from your website, um, because I, I believe also the definition of marriage, as defined by your group, um, is more than just having children. It's about lifelong um, married love and mm -hmm. also a sexual relationship. We've got it up online in terms of, of, of how your organization defines marriage. I, I want to go to you, Matt, quickly in terms of the, the, the law across the country, what kind of impact this might have. I, I think it's really important and the, the president has left room for the states to define marriage as has traditionally been the case. And I think part of the reason that he said that is to give people room to evolve like they did in 1854. The, the conversation will continue, but there has to be a federal baseline of rights. And you can't distinguish a class of people and make them less valued at the hands of their state. That's what we're really talking about. We're out of time, but I want to give you 10 seconds to have the last word. Well, we think that uh, attaching mothers and fathers to their children and one another is a purpose that isn't going to go away, and it is an essential public purpose that still needs to get done no matter how far we evolve. Kids still need a mom and a dad and have a right to know who they are. And we've that's got, not achieved by discrimination. We've got so much more on our website, kppbs.org. Thank you both for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Some San Diego students are getting hands-on lessons about healthy eating. We'll serve that story up in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, remember Alpine's Dinosaur Land, the USS San Diego, and a Valentine's Day story of love in the days of Old Town on Ken Kramer's About San Diego. Then at 8.30 on California's Gold, explore Beauty Ranch, once the home to one of California's famous authors, Jack London. And at 9 on the season finale of Doc Martin, Mrs. Tischel can no longer hide her love for the doc, but what about Louisa and the baby? That's tonight on KPBS. Next time, Antiques Roadshow is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The market for Russian paintings has exploded in oh. the past five years. Oh my God, really? Wow, who knew? What treasures will our experts discover in the city of lakes? Find out when we visit Minneapolis next time on Antiques Roadshow. Monday at 8 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Sixty thousand people are expected to honor former Charger Junior Seau tomorrow night at Qualcomm Stadium. While questions remain about his suicide, it's also put a new focus on brain injuries in professional sports and those serving in combat. Joanne is talking about that at the roundtable. Junior Seau played professional football for 20 years, much of that time with the San Diego Chargers. And while we don't know if repeated blows to the head contributed to his death, there is evidence that repeated concussions over time can cause what's known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. Joining me to discuss CTE, how it's affecting those playing contact sports, and our returning military men and women is my guest, Dr. Michael Lobatz. He is a neurologist and the director of the Rehabilitation Center for Scripps Health in Encinitas. Thank Thank you, doctor, for being here. Thank you. We hear a lot about traumatic brain injury. What's the difference between TBI and now CTE? Well, TBI presupposes that there's a single injury to the brain, and that may be something that you recover from, or it might be something that has lingering effects. 
chronic traumatic encephalopathy presupposes multiple injuries to the brain and a degenerative process that then begins later in life, similar to something like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease where people then progress and worsen over time. And that's very different than a single brain injury where we typically expect patients to have their symptoms initially and then remain the same or get better over time. So how did, how did experts begin to see this CTE? Really the first time we recognized it was in boxing and uh, what we used to call punch drunk, now also known in medicine as dementia pugilistica. Uh, people that have had repeated blows to the brain in that boxing profession can develop memory loss. That worsens over time. And we know that their brains are abnormal in comparison to others in a normal population. Later, it became obvious that this might also occur in other groups, such as people in professional sports, which is what one of the focuses is today in terms of the National Football League. And we have a center in Boston where they're studying chronic traumatic encephalopathy in professional football players. And then lastly, we are very interested now in the effects of the concussions that are occurring in the military in Iraq and Afghanistan from blast injuries that might also put soldiers at eventual risk for the development of the same thing. With regard to the military, how are you seeing this manifest itself, you know, in terms of the men and women returning home? Right now, the uh, soldiers are all very young, and uh, they're in their late teens or 20s or early 30s. And we're noticing that those that have had concussive brain injuries from blast injury uh, may have difficulties with things like memory and concentration. They may have personality change. They may have headaches and dizziness and lightheadedness. And those kinds of symptoms have been reported by that group. And as time has gone by, many of them have gotten better. But it's that group that we're very concerned about in the future, those that have had persistent symptoms that might be at risk to develop this in the later years of their life. So does that mean this will just keep getting worse as you grow older, or can you stop the progression of this disease or even treat it? Well, right now we don't really know the answer to those questions, and uh, we do know that people with repeated brain injuries are at particular risk for this. So if you've had multiple concussions as a boxer or as a football player, or if you've been in multiple accidents with concussions, you may find that you have trouble and difficulty with processing and memory. And those kinds of things are of particular concern to us, and that's where the research is focused. And are you seeing a link between CTE and suicide and even, or depression and even suicide? Well, there certainly is a link between CTE and behavioral changes. To take the leap from CTE all the way to suicide is a very big leap because suicidal ideation is a very complex phenomenon one in which many different things are involved other than just brain function itself. It might have to do with life circumstances, financial circumstances, and changes in your own psychosocial issues. So we do know that people that are depressed have a higher incidence of the development of suicidal ideation and may go on to develop a plan and actually carry out suicide. Fortunately, that's in a very small percent. You know, 5% of the population have depression in the United States, but people with brain injuries, that depression incidence may be as high as 40%. So one thinks that there could be a link between all of those things. Okay, we have to leave it there, Doctor, but we have more information, including links to other resources about this on our website, kpps.org. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Healthy eating and obesity prevention programs are becoming more and more common in schools across the country. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert tells us about a San Diego chef who wants to reconnect students with the fun of cooking and sharing it with friends and family. Who knows where pizza comes from? Chef Ricardo Heredia of South Park's Alchemy always starts his classes with fourth and fifth graders at McKinley Elementary with the same question. Let's start reading our mise en place and then we'll go down the line just like um, we always do and read the method. 
Normally, the cooking classes take place in the school's kitchen. But today, Heredia and Alchemy owner Ron Troyato have rolled grills into the school's garden for a pizza making class. This side is charcoal. Save them so we can put it on our pizza. Right. After picking a few toppings from the garden to add to their pizzas, Let's get started. Heredia students circle up to learn the basics of pizza dough making. So you're just going to want to keep doing this until your dough comes together and forms a ball. But these kids aren't happy to just sit back and watch how things are done. Punch it down. Well, not literally. Let's, <laughs> let's push it down. But Heredia has a few more things on its mind when he plans his classes than students getting their hands dirty. What I want kids to get out of it is, is a basic knowledge of where your food comes from, why, it, why it's healthy, um, why people, um, why farmers are important, um, how to use a knife properly, and, and to cook with their family. I think that's something that um, us as Americans were losing. Heredia and Troyato have been running eight-week classes for students at Albert Einstein Charter School for three years. Our flowers are delicious. Is this is the first class they've offered at McKinley, and Troyato says they hope the growing program can serve as a model for other restaurants that want to reach out to their local schools. Before you start rolling it out. Okay. Along with the cooking, there's a field trip and then um, <clears throat> the education aspect of it that relates to the gardens that they have going typically. Um, and it can also relate to the programs in the classroom, which um, San Diego Unified and, and the other districts in San Diego County are working hard to, to develop the whole system around healthy eating. So we feel like we're, we're part of that. Parents pay $35 for eight after-school classes and for the chef jackets and hats that each young cook gets. Some costs are covered by the school, and all of the adults involved donate their time. Make a cow's own. Any additional costs are absorbed by the restaurant, an arrangement Triado is hoping to change with grant funding eventually. Perfect. The students, though, are more interested in cooking than how the classes came to their campus. Like, my mom would get mad at me because I used to, like, like try to do things in the kitchen. My mom would be like, no, go away, let me cook. And then, so, yeah, I just wanted to cook by myself. So this is the only place I can really do it because my mom gets mad at me. She thinks I'm going to ruin the food. <laughs> I want to kind of learn how to do more than just scrambled eggs. The idea that kids aren't interested in new and different food doesn't hold for this group. Their favorite part of the classes... Well, getting to make new foods that I have never made before. What, like what? The eggplants, the tortillas, the pizza. A little bitter, a little more intense. Heredia says that curiosity shows up in a sophistication about food. I have them describe um, flavor profiles, and it's amazing. I, I get a little bitterness um, from this. So that, that's very smooth and buttery. So they're descriptive terms, and just seeing them think on that level is, is surprising. You want to make your dough into a ball. All right. The students wear their mastery of basic cooking skills unselfconsciously, even showing one public television reporter the ropes of pizza making. Slide it in the oven. Slide it in the oven? Yeah. Yeah. Jeff Ricardo, I, I made a star. And many, like Julia Nunnemaker, are happy to tout their creations. I found some basil and there's mozzarella and carrot slices. And a bit of lettuce. And uh, how did it taste? It's delicious. I especially love the sauce. Faculty advisor Guy DeVos says getting to enjoy the final product keeps the kids engaged. But so does seeing the garden they have science lessons in producing food. There's a big focus in the classes on, on green and not wasting things. And the kids are seeing with the garden that things are going right into something that they can consume. And that's been really exciting for them. Students easily make connections between the work they do in the kitchen and their other classes. One example comes up again and again. Fractions, well, I've been learning in class, but we kind of did it in the cooking class too. In their last class, about four weeks from now, the students will make a three-course meal for two friends or family members. While the kids may not all be headed for careers in the kitchen, they'll know that they can plan and carry out a complex project and make a delicious dinner. See you next week. Star Pizza. Star Pizza. That was education reporter Kyla Calvert. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next News Hour, the heated debate over using chimpanzees as test subjects for science. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour.
garrulous, Mr. Garrow. We have asked for you. He provides defense for the accused. You're a man who will have others hanged for a reward. And in the old Bailey of 18th century England... Mr. Garrow was playing you like a harpist. He fights for justice. Since when have you concerned yourself with what you are allowed to do? I will have my son. You twisted your efforts so an innocent man would hang for it. The series, Garrow's Law. A new season of Garrow's Law begins May 17th, only on KPBS. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Twitter, Facebook, and our website buzzed about our story yesterday on Mayor Jerry Sanders' response to President Obama's support of same-sex marriage. Sanders had a similar change of heart about same-sex marriage five years ago. On our website, the user SD Cyclist wrote, Speaking as a gay man, I don't see myself ever getting married in the eyes of the government. It's not something I personally want to do ever. I'm a few years beyond 40, so it's not an issue I have ever waffled on nor ever see changing for me personally. However, I do believe marriage is a federal right that everyone should be afforded. And on Facebook, Shirley Collier wrote, same-sex couples should have their own thing. Don't lump same-sex unions in with the institution of marriage. Call it waffling, civil union, fairage, whatever, just not marriage. Well, you can weigh in on the conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, you can email me. Jay Farian at kpbs.org. The Federal Department of Agriculture says about 75,000 dogs are used every year in research labs, and the vast majority are beagles. Today, a nonprofit rescue facility in El Cajon showed off 20 of the dogs recently released from a testing lab in San Diego. Let's just say there was a lot of humping going on at this event where 20 male beagles were exercising their freedom. These dogs range in age from four to seven, They've all been neutered, vaccinated, and microchipped. Rebecca Stevens loves animals and runs a doggy daycare center in El Cajon. These guys have never seen the light of day or touched grass, so this is their first time getting to experience the outside world. Stevens also started a nonprofit rescue called Four Paws about 10 years ago after realizing so many beagles are homeless. But she faces a moral dilemma. She's conflicted over testing on animals that can save people's lives. I finished my chemo a year ago, and then we just rescued 20 beagles. I mean, it, it's a little emotional for me. So um, it feels good to be here. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the industry to a degree. Stevens joined a network of people who rescue and find homes for these dogs. Shannon Keith is one of them and says, Beagles are used for lab testing because of their docile, forgiving nature. Uh, they test uh, animals for various reasons, for uh, cosmetics, for products, and for pharmaceuticals. Usually those are the main three reasons. All these dogs are up for adoption, and Four Paws says most of that is done through the Pet Finders website, where you can also fill out an application. And they love playing with each other, you know, because they're so pack-oriented. Debbie Riggs lives in City Heights and has adopted or rescued six of these rabbit chasers. You just can't have one beagle. <laughs> it's just one of the type of dogs. Anybody that has beagles would usually have more than one. Four Paws Coon Hound Rescue and Friends is located in El Cajon. It's currently looking for homes for at least 12 beagles. The others are headed for homes in Los Angeles. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great night.